Bibles this morning to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Thankful to see each one that's come this way this morning. Thankful to see those here that are visiting with us. We're thankful that you've come this morning. Trust you receive a blessing from being here. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to begin reading in the first verse. Before we begin reading, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day, for the blessings of it, Lord. You know the things that we stand in need of. And I pray, Lord, that you would help me this morning, give me the words to speak. I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts this morning, that we could receive your word. Forgive us, Lord, of our failures, you know, uh, the ways that we have failed you, Lord. And I pray that you would forgive us of those. I pray you would give us wisdom, Lord. Help us to understand. Uh, the things of your word, Lord. I pray for the lost, that they could see their need of Jesus while there's time and opportunity. Each request mentioned, Lord, I pray that you would bless in each one for these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh, of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his, in his kindness toward us through, Je through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're going to stop reading there uh, in verse 9. We want to really just focus on one statement that's made here this morning. Uh, in this section of scripture but in order to do that we're going to kind of look at the context of what Paul is speaking of he makes the statement in verse 6 he says made us that he hath made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that's what I want to try to talk to you for a few minutes about this morning that he has made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus but I want you to notice how the chapter begins he says you hath he quickened He's talking to people who are saved. He's talking to people who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. The word quicken means to be made alive. And he has made us alive. Uh, when I was lost, for I had trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, I thought I understood what it, mean, what it meant to live. I thought I understood what it meant to be alive and, and to, to, to have life. I had blood running through my veins. I was breathing. And I thought I was doing okay. I thought I was alive. I didn't truly know how to live until Jesus saved my soul. I did not understand, I didn't even understand what it, what it meant to be alive until Jesus saved me. How did he do that? The scripture talks about a circumcision made without hands. It's the cutting away of the flesh is what it's uh, talking about. It's the spirit of God comes in. Uh, when we're saved, we trust Jesus Christ. And the spirit, uh, uh, excuse me, the, the soul is separated from the flesh. So how does that happen? By the word of God. We're regenerated by the word of God. We're quickened by the spirit of God. And so uh, the circumcision made without hands. The word of God spoken of as a sword, a sharp, so, uh, sharp two-edged sword to the dividing of sunder, of joint and marrow, and soul and spirit. Uh, the, the word of God is so sharp that it can cut to a person's heart. It can cut to not their physical heart, to their spiritual heart. It can cut to their soul, and it can divide the flesh from the soul. My flesh can no longer do anything that would cause me to be lost. My flesh can no longer do anything that will separate me from the love of Christ. I am saved forevermore. I am saved eternally. And I'm saved by Jesus Christ. I've been made to sit in heavenly places. Romans chapter 5 makes a statement that I have 
peace with God this morning. You can have peace with God. Let, let me just say this. What, what Paul is doing is he's, he's helping us understand what it means to be saved. What we have in trusting Jesus Christ. I had a, a, a lady ask me one day. I've, I've had it, quite a few different people ask me this, this same question. Uh, you may have noticed it as well. But one thing, what was asked me was, why do preachers preach different today than they preached years ago? I said, well, what do you mean by that? I don't, I don't understand the question. They said, well, preachers years ago used to preach a lot about hell. I, well, I really don't understand. I, I don't know. Uh, the only thing I can say is that I preach hell every time God puts it on my heart. Every time. And, that's, and he has, and I have preached it. I said, but I want you to think of this. This could be why. They said, what? I said, hell is what we miss. If we trust Jesus Christ, hell is what we miss. We don't have to go there. But a lot of what God gives me to preach is what we get when we trust Jesus. And I think both are important. And I think we need to concentrate on both of them. And so this morning, it is very true that if you do not trust Jesus Christ, you will spend an eternity in a lake of fire. You will eternally be separated from God, which is an eternal death. You will have a body. I don't know of what type. I don't know what it's going to look like. The Scripture doesn't tell us all about that. But you'll be resurrected. It's called the resurrection of the wicked. And it's spoken of in Revelation chapter 20. You'll be resurrected. You'll stand before God. You'll be judged by your works and you'll be cast into the lake of fire where you'll burn for all eternity but not burn up. Where you'll suffer for all eternity and the suffering will never end and it'll be more than physical pain. That's true. And you don't have to go there. You don't have to spend eternity that way. You can trust the Lord you can trust Jesus this morning, and you can be saved, and you don't have to worry about that anymore. No more a thought of that, because that's over with. You've missed that. But this morning, what I want to try to tell you is what you're going to get in some forms. And fo focus just mainly on one. That we've made, been made to sit together in heavenly places. We've been made alive. We've got eternal life. We'll never die. Age is the number. I am never going to die. This old body is going to go away one day. <laughs> and I'm going to go on to be with the Lord, but I will forever be with God. He says, I have peace with God. I've become dead to the law by the body of Christ. That is, Christ paid the debt of sin for me. And his death counts for me. I've become dead to the law. I don't have to perform all of those laws. I don't have to be perfect to enter into heaven because Christ has already done all of that for me. And I have it because it's been put on my account by God just by simply trusting Jesus Christ by faith. All my sins were put on Christ. He paid for them. And Christ's righteousness was given to me and imputed to me. And so I can go to heaven. I can have eternal life. I can spend eternity with God for what Christ has done for me. Now notice this, the next two verses, he mentions those that are lost or what it was like to be lost, how we lived as lost individuals. He says, we're in time past, you walked according to the course of this world. The, the scripture, when it uses the word world in this kind of context, it's speaking of society, that society tells individuals what to do. Society deems what's good and what's bad. Society did kind of deems about how we should live our lives. And either we can listen to society or we can go on and uh, reject what society has to say. But most people walk according to uh, the society and according to the course of the world. So uh, even if we don't walk according to what society tells us to and we reject some kind of social construct, then we still walk in, in one way according to that of the course of this world. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, education, for instance. Let, let's just talk about uh, college degrees. There was a time when I was growing up, uh, one of the things my, my father wanted for us, he said, I, I, I never got the opportunity to go to college. And I want all three of y'all, me and my two older brothers, I want y'all to have the opportunity to go to college. 
and I want you to get a college degree. And he said, I will, I will do everything that I can uh, to help you get one. I want to put you through college. I want you to have a college degree so that you can have a future, right? Does a person have to have a college degree to have a future? Where do we get that mindset from? Do you know that there are people who have college degrees that are flipping hamburgers because they can't find jobs? I'm not telling you this morning education is not important. What I'm telling you is education is wonderful in its place. But it has to stay in its place. Society has sold us on the idea that a person has to have a college degree in order to function in society. And that is simply not true. So as long as, and if that is true this morning, you say, well, that's no way. That's, that, that, that can't be. A person cannot function in society without a college degree. Okay, so the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and get a college degree and all these things will be added unto you, right? No, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and God will see that you have everything else. Now, again, I'm not trying to discourage you from college. I'm just trying to help us understand that society sometimes can tell us things that we mistake for the truth, and it's really not the truth in and of itself. Let me give you another one. Uh, according to the course of this world, society also can tell us about things. Uh, for instance, that it's not wrong to drink alcohol. Society tells us that it's not. Do you know it's wrong to do anything that impairs your mind? That's not just alcohol. That's any means to impair your mind. We walked in time past according to the course of this world. We walked based upon what society deemed to be okay and what society didn't deem to be okay. We walked according to the social constructs of the world. Through these, the devil has led us, conquered us, captured us. We've become a slave. Look at the next statement. He says, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh the children of disobedience. That is, you think of Eve for a moment. The problem with Eve was that she wanted to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. She desired to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The devil just simply convinced her to do that. He enticed her to do that, and she listened. She followed him. The problem is, and one of the reasons the devil has control over a person that is lost, is the devil entices you do, to do things that you already want to do. And so the devil can take complete control of you, and you never know it, because all he's enticing you to do is things that you already want to do. And when a person's lost, the only guide that they have is their heart and their their own desires and how many times do we hear people tell these children just follow your heart that's the worst advice that you can give a child their heart is deceitful above all things desperately wicked the scripture says it's going to lead them into sin and the devil it will control them through the very desires of their heart I'm going to tell you something this morning. You need something a whole lot more than your heart to guide you. You need to be guided by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. This morning, you can have the Spirit of God. You can, you, the Spirit of God will come and dwell in you and guide you in life. You'll trust Jesus Christ this morning. But a person just lives to gratify the flesh when he's lost. Look at verse 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. And the lust of the flesh, of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now, verse 4, some of my favorite two words in the Bible, but God. All of this, but God. You see, what Paul is saying is that we were in a position where we could not save ourselves. We were in a position where there was nothing that we could do for ourselves, but God stepped in and took care of things for us. You've heard the, probably if you're here, you, you've, you've heard preaching all your life, you've heard of someone use the, the idea of perfection that in order to meet the standard that God uh, has set for us is like taking a test and uh, you can't fail the test, you can't even miss a question on the test, you've got to make a hundred. Uh, but the test is so far above us and so far out of bounds 
from us that it would be like sitting the ACT in front of a kindergartner and telling him you can't miss a, can't miss a question on it. We say, well, that's impossible. Exactly. And then we see and we begin to understand how prideful it is for us to think that we could save ourselves, that we need no help from no, anybody else. I, I, don't, I don't need anybody to help me. I'm going to take this test, and I'm going to pass it. I'm going to make 100 on it. I'm not going to miss any question. That's, like, that, that's the same idea of, as the statement of, of I'm, going to, I'm going to be okay. I, I don't need any help. I, I'm okay like I am. This morning, the law is the standard. That's the test. That's the law. Don't covet. Have you ever desired to have anything that's not yours and it controlled your mind? To the place that it just kind of consumed you? Don't lie. Thou shalt not lie. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to prove to you that we've all failed. But God has come in, God has stepped in, God has taken the test for us in Jesus Christ. And we can be saved in him. Now I want you to notice as he goes down, he, uh, he makes a statement, he says, God who is rich in mercy. By the way, there's a difference between God's mercy and God's grace. God's mercy is God not giving to us what we deserve. And God's grace is... Is God giving to us what we don't deserve? Do you see the difference? God, God's mercy is not sending us to hell because that's what we deserve. God's grace is allowing us to live with him forever in heaven where we do not deserve to be. It's the difference between God's mercy and God's grace. And so God was rich and is rich in mercy. And he wants to have mercy upon you this morning through Jesus Christ. He says, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, and by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now what does that mean? Today one of the things that I have, promises if you will, are, are, are wonderful uh, benefits of trusting Jesus Christ is that I have been made to sit together with him in heavenly places. Back up to chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians. Again, I love to read chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians. It's a reminder of what all God has done for us in Jesus Christ and how we've been saved, even counting the time that God is referred to as Paul would write about what all he's done for us. Look at verse 3. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now I want you to notice what he said, that he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What does this mean? What is this idea of being blessed in heavenly places and being able to see it in heavenly places? And what does that mean for us when we've trusted Jesus Christ? I want you to notice what he says. Verse 4, he says, According as he had chosen us before the foundation of the world, he has chosen us, he has predestinated us, all of this before the foundation of the world. What does this mean? What this means has nothing to do with who, but it has everything to do with what they receive. I want you to notice what he's saying. Because every person who trusts Jesus Christ, this is what he's saying, every person who trusts Jesus Christ will get this. From the foundation of the world, they will be holy and without blame before him. It's been chosen from the foundation of the world. Any person who trusts Jesus will be holy and without blame before him in love. 
Also this, having predestinated us unto this. Everyone who trusts Jesus Christ has been predestined to the adoption of the children. In other words, that we will be adopted by God as, as a child of his. To as many as believed in him gave he power to become the sons of God. The idea is that God established some things from the foundation of the world that we were going to receive in Christ Jesus, whoever trusted him. Why is that important? Turn over to the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 8 real quick. Turn to the book of Hebrews and chapter 8 real quick. While you're turning, the key word, one of the key words to the book of Hebrews is the word better. So Christ is better than the angels. And the point is, the angels gave the old Levitical law. Christ is better than the angels. Christ is better than the Levitical law itself. Christ is better than Moses, who brought the Levitical law. Christ, continually, we see this. Okay, so what has been stated in chapter 7 by the writer of the book of Hebrews is that Christ is better than Melchizedek. Now, you talk about the old Levitical priesthood. Did God ever intend for salvation to come through the Levitical priesthood? How do we know that? So you've got all of these covenants, specifically the old covenant from Mount Sinai that precedes the new covenant that's been made, that is established in Jesus Christ upon better promises. He is the mediator of this new covenant. I want you to notice what he's speaking of now. Verse 1, chapter 8. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set in the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if we were on earth, he should not be, for if he, excuse me, were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and the shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God, when he was about to make the tabernacle, see, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. Now let me just get across what all he was trying to say in those few verses. God made a covenant with Moses. And that, that covenant had priests in it, the Levitical priesthood. And so what he's trying to prove is if salvation was intended to come through the Levitical priesthood, then why in Psalm 110 verse 4 did God say that there was going to be a priest come after the order of Melchizedek? Why would there even need to be another priest come if the Levitical priesthood was going to bring salvation? If the old tabernacle was where God dwelt, Where'd God get the pattern to give it to Moses and tell him to build it exactly based upon this pattern? You see, what the writer's trying to prove is the pattern of the tabernacle that God gave to Moses was patterned after the one in heaven. The priesthood was a shadow of Jesus Christ's priesthood in heaven. The Old Testament was an earthly thing that shadowed a heavenly covenant. We have... Why is that important? Because all of these things are heavenly things. That from the foundation of the world, God intended it to be this way. There was a tabernacle from the foundation of the world that God dwelt in. That there was a priest coming from the foundation of the world that would intercede for mankind. Why is that important? Because some people tell us today that Israel lived by the old covenant. And, and so they're under the old covenant. What does that mean? What does the old covenant say? God told the nation of Israel, you keep my laws and my statutes and I'll be your God and you shall be my people. Did the nation of Israel keep God's laws? I mean, Moses come off of Mount Sinai and they were in idolatry. They failed. 
The whole point of the old covenant was to show the failure of mankind, that man would become, or sin rather, would become exceeding sinful, that we would understand exactly how awful we are and how far from the standard that we come. And it all points to heavenly things, to the heavenly covenant that we have with a, with a high priest who's seated at the right hand of the throne of God, who's making intercession for us as we speak, in verse, or chapter 7, verse 25, says of this high priest that he's able to save us to the uttermost, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Why is that important? Why is all of this important? Let me put it together for you. About November, we're going to have an election. And I'm going to go cast my vote for a man who's going to go to Washington to sit in the House of Representatives. And his job there is to represent the mind of all of us who are in this district or in the district that I vote in, whoever that would be. He's going to represent us. And he's supposed to be representing me when he makes laws. He's supposed to be representing my frame of mind as he makes these laws. He's supposed to be representing the ways that I think. And you say, well, that's impossible. There's so many people and then everybody disagrees. Well, that's, yeah. But I have a representative in heaven who's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He is a representative of mankind who has lived perfectly who has accomplished the standard that God has set. He gave his life on the cross at Calvary, and God raised him from the dead the third day as proof of who he is. And he's seated at the right hand of God as a representative for all humanity and will live forevermore. That, what, that, let me tell you, that representative in Washington could care less what I think. But the representative that I have that's seated next to God in heaven, in heaven, knows the very thoughts of my heart, cares for me, and loves me more than I can understand, has saved my soul. And today he'll save yours too, if you'll trust him. The scripture tells us that we can come boldly into the throne of grace and mercy before God's throne. We can come boldly. That doesn't mean arrogantly we can kick the door in. And that, what it means is that I can come in confidence. I saw a statement made this morning. I can't remember who posted it. It may have been one of y'all. I don't remember. But the statement was about the sun. It said the sun can burn your eyes out from 92, 92 million miles away. The sun can burn your eyes out from 92 million miles away. You think about that. 92 million miles away, the sun can burn your eyes out, and you think you're going to stroll into, it, into the throne room of the maker? Just casually stroll right in there? I have a representative with the creator of heaven, the creator of earth. Why is that important? And that may not mean anything to y'all, but I'm nobody. I'm never going to invent anything. I'm never going to be a famous person. They're going to bury me one day, and 25 years later, the folks ain't even going to know my name. They're not even going to remember who I am. I'm nothing. I'm nobody. But God knows me personally. And he set it up in such a way that he has a man to represent me. And he cares about my, thought, my thoughts. My, my, he hears my prayers. My requests. And I can talk to him. I've been made, and all of us that are saved, have been made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This morning, if you're lost, 
you can have that too. This morning, if you're lost, you can be saved. After Jesus was crucified and he was resurrected, he spent four, about 40 days in a short time remaining on earth. After that period of time, he went to the Mount of Olives with his disciples. And he began to ascend. And the disciples watched as this man, as he told Thomas, he said, I'm not a spirit, I'm flesh and bone, come touch me. This man ascended from the Mount of Olives as these disciples watched. And he descended into heaven. And he's seated at the right hand of God. Stephen said, I see Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. These men gave eyewitness testimonies that they watched Jesus ascend up to heaven to be seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Why? I believe that so we could know that there's a man, there's one of us in heaven. He is the mediator between us and God. And the only way we're ever going to have peace with God is through him. But through him, we have a representative with God. And we've been made to sit together in heavenly places. And this morning, that promise belongs to you if you'll trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can be made to sit together with the rest of us in heavenly places while we have a verse of the song.